and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Colleen Chen, Professor of Law at Santa Clara University School of Law. We will discuss her article, The Second Chance Gap, which will be published in the Michigan Law Review. So welcome to the show, Colleen. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to this because I think this is a really powerful article on an extremely timely subject that I think is on a lot of people's minds. But for people who haven't already heard about this project, I wonder if you could just start by talking about a little bit about what you mean by a second chance. Like, what are second chance laws as you define them and and when do they apply? Sure. So. I'm a patent lawyer and a patent law professor, and I also am a mom. So I think that having two boys um, (laughs) has led me to have an instinct to some degree for criminal justice in the sense of, uh, you know, every day different things happen in our house and uh, they, you know, may go one way or another, but, you know, at the end of the day, we forgive each other and we get a second chance the next day. Um, And if it wasn't like that, you know, second chance for me as a parent or for second chances for my kids um, in, in every day, we wouldn't really be able to, to go on. So I, in the criminal justice context, which this paper is set in, a second chance is really the idea that we want to make sure that people, after they've paid their dues in terms of criminal conviction, serving time, or just having had even a criminal engagement with the, the police, are able to have a clean start and uh, have a second chance when they're re-entering society or they're coming back uh, into the workforce to have a clean record. Um, and in particular, the domains I focus on are re-entry with respect to rethinking the time of the time in which a person, the, the amount of time a person is sentenced to. So resentencing and re-entry, uh, re-enfranchisement. So in the United States, we're unique in that we take away the rights of felons many of, in many states to vote. So giving them their vote back, re-enfranchisement, and then giving people a clean slate, uh, clearing their criminal record. So re-enfranchisement, resentencing, and getting a clean slate. Mm. Well, for, so from your paper, I get the impression that there are are a lot of different kinds of laws in this space and that they differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Is is that a fair understanding of of the nature of the laws that you're talking about? Right, so because we are working in the criminal justice system, which is primarily a state-based system, right? We have uh, the majority of people who are encountering uh, the police and being convicted in courts, have, doing all of that at the state level. So that means that every state gets to decide under what circumstances they're going to offer a second chance. Uh, as you mentioned, there are both sort of second chance laws, like the ones I've talked about, but there are also a lot of other strategies, for example, to take away information about a personal's former conviction that are also meant to give people a second chance. Mm. Well, maybe you could talk a little bit just specifically about some examples of second chance laws and how they work and what they're intended to accomplish, just so that listeners kind of understand more of the specifics of sort of some of the particular measures that you're talking about in the paper. Sure. And a lot of this has been in the news recently. So I'll just kind of pick up upon that. So you know, one thing that happened late last year was that the president signed the First Step Act, and that was meant to um, really try to, it was a bipartisan bill, one of the few things that that was able to be passed into law. And the idea there was just that um, there was a desire to give more good chance, good, a lot of things that the the bill did, but one of them, one of them was to um, allow for those who had been penalized under a disparity in sentencing between crack and cocaine to get a shorter sentence. So one thing would be if you're sentenced to, you know, uh, six years in prison, but you're able to make that time shorter, 
the uh, First Step Act allowed for that time calculation to take place and there to be a shorter sentence. Um, what really surprised me learning, you know, sort of learning about the criminal justice system for the first time is that many people do not serve their full sentence. And so there are many different ways in which a person can, even once sentenced, get a second chance and have a shorter, a shorter time period that, they're, that they serve. So that would be one concrete example where I'm sentenced to you know, six years and I only have to serve two or three, then I might have probation or I might even have a shortened sentence due to um, good, good behavior in, in prison. Uh, another example, again, as I mentioned before, which is much more straightforward, is that I lose my vote while I'm serving my felony conviction, but then when I'm out, I've rehabilitated myself, I'm, um, I regain the right to vote. Um, the third, again, is, is an example where I've, um, you know, had some time in, in, in prison uh, and I've served my conviction. Uh, I've come out and I want a fresh start. I want to, you know, become a professional. I want to uh, go to school. I want to um, do a lot of things. Right now, there are a lot of doors that are closed to you, even though you've served your time. So it's this kind of sense of serving this eternal sentence, even though you've com com completed your formal time. So a, a, an, an example of a second chance there would be that rather than being barred from applying for a job, you're able to, to now uh, be eligible because your um, conviction does not show up anymore because you've expunged it. Mm, mm. Well, so in the paper, you talk about a second chance gap. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you mean by a gap. What is the nature of the gap you identify? Why does it matter? And is it like consistent across jurisdictions or widely different? So the reason I even started thinking about this was a former student of mine who is a national leader now. She's the co uh, founder of Cut50, uh, now working for the Reform Alliance, she uh, gave a talk based on her work saying, and uh, you know, I'm a person who works in innovation, she said, well, you know, there are a lot of people that are sitting in prison uh, that are there because of a math, a math miscalculation. Um, and I was completely shocked by that statement, the idea that there could be eligibility to have a shorter sentence, but people weren't getting it because of kind of red tape bureaucracy and just really old uh, non-functioning IT systems. So as I looked into this further, I started to see more headlines like the ones I write about in the paper where, for example, California made a mistake in calculating sentences where they used 15% uh, rather than 50, 50% in the calculation. And that resulted in millions of dollars of taxpayer um, money being spent in over, over uh, incarcerating people. They were supposed to be able to get out earlier, but they didn't because of these sort of logistical errors. Um, and so as I just was looking around in different domains, I could see more and more that this was a common theme where, you know, we've decided as a society, we want to restore the rights of individuals who are affected by the criminal justice system, but we haven't provided effective pathways for them to actually access those rights. And so there is this, what I call, gap between eligibility and delivery of the second chance. Mm. Well, so what's causing that kind of gap then? I mean, you would think that if people had an opportunity to get out of prison, they'd, they'd jump on it. Is the problem that they don't know or that they can't afford it or that they don't have the methods to contest how long they're being incarcerated for or their ability to get back some of the other rights that you mentioned? Yeah, I think it's all of the above. And in each situation, as you sort of alluded to earlier, there there was a maybe a different story of what is the main contributor to that particular gap. But um, lack of awareness is a huge problem where you don't necessarily know you have the right. Maybe there's a new decision that comes out of a court or there's a new bill that's passed that gives you rights, but you don't actually have the ability to, to you don't know that that is something you're eligible for. And often these rules are very complicated and it takes a lot of work to figure out, you know, am I somebody who can qualify um, for it? There are sort of general rules and then exceptions and there's whether retroactivity applies if your uh, condition falls before the enactment date. And so sometimes it can be very difficult first to know that it's available, but then to know whether or not you have the particular right. Um, the other, I think, main challenge, though, I think, is that a lot of this work is petition based. So it's incumbent on the petitioner or the um, criminally justice, cr criminal criminally involved individual to figure all this out, to navigate, as you mentioned, to pay the fees, um, which can be quite high, uh, and to, to take advantage of the second chance. 
And so um, I think the, the thinking in, in the paper and in general is to say, if we really truly want to provide these second chances, we should think about automation because all the information to calculate eligibility often exists within the system, right? So if it's, you know, Brian can expunge his um, conviction if he's stayed clean for a couple of years and the conviction was of, of a certain type, for example, in Kentucky, there was a, um, since I know that's where you're from, there was recently a bill a couple of years ago that allowed for certain um, nonviolent felonies uh, for those who had been crime free for five years to petition to have their convictions vacated. But for you to know that, you know, is this a Cl uh, class D felony, how, where does this thing fall? Um, how does it, you know, how do we calculate the time? Do we do it from the time of disposition or the time that I finish my sentence? That can be a lot of uh, burden to put on an individual who already is probably struggling to, to sort of uh, reintegrate. So uh, the idea again of the paper is really to say, we have this um, other way path forward through automation where a lot of the information exists in the system, why don't we think about if we're going to take away the rights, giving them back um, in an automated fashion. Well, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the variance in actual application of some of these second chance laws, because I, I found that astonishingly large when I read your paper. Yeah, it's pretty shocking. Um, you know, in California, for example, we have legalized marijuana and we provided for um, ways for people who have old marijuana convictions to expunge those. I mean, this is no longer illegal. A lot of the things that uh, people were penalized for. So, but we started out with a petition-based system and I found going county by county that, you know, the uptake of the remedy of records clearance was really low, you know, in the 10% range. And there's been other studies in Michigan that show the uptake there was, you know, five to 6%. And I'm in the process now of documenting this rate across uh, the country. Um, so th that is very low. Now, California did pass um, a, a provision recently to automate the identification of people who are eligible for um, relief and then have this, the actual counties do it. So when that happens, I think that'll be much smaller. So in the paper, I talk about how um, with respect to, you know, even similar types of relief, you get really very great variance depending on how the, the law is implemented. So Pennsylvania, for example, is going through a, what they've called a clean slate um, act. They've, they're one of three states, California being the third that I just mentioned, Utah being the second, and then U Pennsylvania being the first, to try to automate a lot of what they're doing. So I expect their gap to become very small. Mm. Well, so, so you do quite a bit of empirical work in the paper as well. I wonder if you could talk about some of the studies that you did for the purpose of this paper, sort of how you structured them and what you were looking at. Sure. So a lot of the work in terms of thinking about um, people, you know, getting early relief from prison sentences under new laws or being reenfranchised, all of this, all of this calculation requires um, kind of full perspective on the data. And a lot of times you don't have that because um, it's hard to sort of get um, access to that information. And we have all these different systems or very artisanal where, you know, in California, we have tens and tens of counties and they all use different systems. So it's slightly different, access is different, you have to do different data sharing. So, um, you know, each one had to be constructed in its own way. I was lucky to be able to draw upon administrative data uh, and studies that had been done for state, say state legislatures um, and to look for those, those, those bits of information. I'm actually working a little bit with some folks who are uh, in states and getting data from them through data sharing. Uh, but I was also fortunate, I think once I started doing the work, uh, and this was again my first kind of criminal justice foray, but I think because the concept seemed to be something that people had lived through their experience and knew about, so they, they could immediately identify with the idea, um, I was fortunate enough to get uh, access to a, a number of data um, sources that were very helpful in trying to do this work at scale. So that involved, for you know, for um, the, the with respect to to getting background check data across the 50 states, getting that data, and then working with um, advocates to, or really the cent the um, uh, national clean slate movement to get uh, data or modeling assumptions about states get that to be accurate and so applying those two things together could allow me to figure out who's eligible and then use that to kind of determine what the gap is. 
Mm -hmm. Well, and so in relation to the studies that you did, what kind of findings did you come to in relation to sort of what was driving uptake in second chances or perhaps the lack thereof? Yeah, so I mean, I think that the gaps that exist, I don't think they're there by design. I mean, I think there there are some folks who would say, well, we want to make sure that people who get their second chances, really earn them. They want, want them, you know, the most extreme case would be the pardon where I have to go back into court and say how I've changed my life and then get that uh, blessing from the governor in most situations. So in some cases, the petition and the process of going through sort of redemption is intentional. But I think in other cases, the legislature just didn't think a lot about how they would implement. And so sometimes what you have is this kind of difference between what actually was drafted in the law and what can be done so for in, in actual practice so for example if you um, put into the statute that a person needs to reach a certain age before they can access the relief then you know it's very hard to automate that if you don't have date of birth in the actual criminal record uh, other provisions will kind of refer to um, certain types of crimes that can be convicted, but they won't provide a precise definition. So that leaves people wondering, you know, do I qualify or I don't? So some of it, I think, is a lack of coordination between those who are writing the bills and those who are implementing them. And I think having sort of um, data providers, technologists, the, the actual people who are going to implement at the table up front is really important. So I talk about in the paper this difference in clemency, I'm now shifting to the resentencing domain of second chance work, where you had you know, the Obama uh, clemency initiative, and then you contrast that with um, the drugs minus two kind of resentencing initiative, and those came out with very different outcomes. Um, and that I think was because the, of the way that things were implemented and, and administered. In the case of the Obama initiative, you had um, sort of people, uh, applying the criteria in ways that weren't always completely clear. Uh, uh, there was, um, you know, those who were applying for it weren't always doing it in a way where it was centralized. Um, that's a problem, I think, in California as well, where you have many counties and they all have different systems. You contrast that with, you know, the drugs minus two uh, case where you had uh, the Sentencing Commission work with the sort of folks in uh, the legislature in Congress to say, well, let's make sure that we um, understand who might be eligible under different ways of doing this. Let's implement this in the right way. So again, that front end um, coordination is, is really important. Uh, another key difference is, again, the quality of the underlying information and how disparate it is. Um, I think centralization, if you think about technology in general, if you think about scalability, if you can have systems that, you know, definitions and approaches that can work across counties, that's a lot more productive than having every county come up with its own approach that um, ends up, you know, breeding a lot of different, uh, different um, models. And then you don't have really the incentive for, say, a technology provider to come in because there's so many small counties out there reaching and selling to all of them would be very challenging. If you have a centralized system, you can get it all done at once. So, you know, I think, you know, towards the, you know, lessons learned, thinking up front about how this is going to be implemented and done, and then also trying to roll out protocols that can be used across all the jurisdictions of interest, I think uh, can, is really important. And then, of course, having the, the, the political will to say, we, we really do want to make sure that the, the law has its full force. It's not going to be something where, you know, we'll, we'll feel like this is success only if 1% of the people uh, take this this remedy up. Um, it's you know saying this is what we believe. We think it's not only in the interest of the individuals to get their second chance, but it's better for society. It's it's going to um, benefit our economy, benefit our economy, and the families of the people that are affected and their communities more generally. So we really want to ensure this is this is delivered. That's also very important. Mm. Well, so this is one thing that really surprised me about your paper. I mean, you know, the cynic in me kind of says, well, you know, maybe some of these laws were really just window dressing and they were designed to be hard to use or to not really have the application that they purport to have. But mm -hmm. some of the ones you described seem like that's really not the case. I mean, I have to say, like, the Obama clemency program, for example, strikes me as, you know, on its face seems to be something that they wanted it to work. And yet you show in the paper that it <laughs> the uptake was like shockingly low. I mean, why do you think that is? Did, did the policymakers just not fully appreciate 
what the implementation of the program was going to look like and you know what could or should they have done differently do you think right and i would say there's been a lot of postmortem on that program in particular and why it was uh, you know, why there was such a low match between those that the sentencing, the sentencing commission identified were eligible, you know, it's something, it's less than 10%, I think it's, you know, in the order of less than 5% of those they found that were eligible and the, the, you know, of, of that list, how many people actually um, got the remedy. So again, I think there's, you know, you'll get many different answers, I think, from folks who've thought hard about what went wrong, but I do think the lack of consistency the decentralized manner in which uh, the program was taken out, taken, taken on, uh, was a, was a major factor. And then I think just the the actual mechanics of looking through a an application and reviewing it and coming to determination uh, made it a lot harder. So that's where I think it feels more like a pardon system, where you know if you can come up with a set of criteria that um, you know, there's very little discretion at the end of it, that makes a more efficient process. So in that case, you had a lot of, you know, and I prepared a number of applications. This is kind of how I got into it. I was, you know, I, I did pro bono work um, with my students and we applied, we prepared these great applications. I had these um, clients who I thought were, you know, just perfect candidates. Like we got talked to their families and got all these support letters and they on paper were perfect candidates but they never had their applications reviewed. And so we never got a chance to even know if, if they had passed the criteria. So part of it was also just the administration where a lot of the applications got in um, and the timing didn't work for them to get reviewed before the president left office. So th there are a number of factors there. And I mean, I will stay, we'll still say that the president, uh, President Obama still um, gave pardons to more people than you know any other previous president. So it's not to say that the program was completely unsuccessful, but there was a lot of potential, I think, that was not realized because of these bureaucratic problems. Mm. Well, maybe you could talk a little bit about the advantage of increasing access to or uptake of these kinds of second chance laws. I mean, obviously, you know, when we create a policy, ideally we want the policy to apply to everyone who is appropriately within the scope of the policy. But are there kind of downstream effects that you think are particularly important that, you know, people should be aware of and thinking about why it would be better for these policies to be applied more effectively? Well, so I think we have now um, three or you know two and then one unpublished studies about what happens to individuals when they get their second chance with respect to expungement. There are also studies around civic engagement of people who get their vote back um, and uh, resentencing. I think you know there's a lot of benefits to society, you know, m millions of dollars saved in incarceration costs and then also you know, allowing people to come back into the workforce in all these cases in a much more substantial way. Um, but beyond like sort of like immediate benefits, um, I think there's uh, the question of more generally in the economics literature, we talk about the allocation of talent and people, you know, being able to do and the, you know, realize their potential and and sort into the, the best profession. So here I'll draw on an anecdote um, that was in my son's school, an after school teacher got caught up in this sort of um, situation where he was accused of a crime that he was ultimately not convicted of, but just being accused got was enough to get him basically fired from his school job and then bar him from being um, in working in school administration. And that was his life calling to be uh, for, there for kids. And he's a you know, very talented mentor, coach, and now he's completely changed his direction. And that's him not using his, you know, being used to his highest and best use. And, you know, multiply that across society. We talk about uh, all the folks who are sorting into different jobs, aren't working, uh, maybe homeless, right? They're all these different uh, consequences, collateral consequences that um, prevent people, once they've been touched by the criminal justice system, from being able to be fully uh, contributing to society. And so I think it's a real loss if we think about the number of people, even as we sort of make a turn in criminal justice and re reduce how many people are in prison, the number of people with prison records or cr criminal records is still a really significant number. Um, and so those folks, you know, particularly, you know, the prevalence of people, the, of criminal records among these marginal, mar marginalized populations uh, is quite high. So again, thinking about how do we 
ensure um, that criminal involvement does not then become a downward spiral for individuals, I think is, is crucially important. So um, I think, you know, thinking about inequality, honestly, the reason, another reason I got into this work is because it felt like this was sort of ground zero about thinking once you have that criminal contact, your outcomes are, um, you know, significantly impacted, you know, no matter what you, what you do afterwards, it's always seen through the lens of you have this mark. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, I, th I think an area where it's, you know, you have the immediate savings on the system, you have, you know, the immediate benefit to people you know, participating more in our democracy on the voting side or um, being able to kind of be more uh, able to volunteer, serve on juries, do things like that, remove collateral consequences. But then longer term, you, um, you, you just allow people to be in the system and not um, have that sort of be this eternal um, uh, 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 consequence that's going to continue to burden them. Mm. Well, so for policymakers who are thinking about implementing laws of these kinds, like what recommendations based on your research would you make for maximizing the effectiveness and application of these kinds of laws? In other words, when you're, when you're structuring a law, what should policymakers be thinking about or including within the law in order to increase the likelihood and uh, availability, the likelihood it'll be actually applicable and the sort of ease of people to take advantage of these opportunities? Well, answer first by mentioning to anybody who might be interested in thinking about clean slate in their own states, focusing just on records, um, you know, criminal records. And I think, you know, of these three categories of things I talk about in the, in the paper, this is the biggest one. So if any policymaker at, at state level is interested in trying to bring this to their states, there is a national movement called the Clean Slate Movement. Again, as I mentioned, three states um, so far have, have passed laws, but there are a host of more, I think, of campaigns that are planned for next year. Uh, so there's a lot of resources that are available, and these have largely been bipartisan um, efforts. So, you know, especially if you're thinking about, I think we have a, a huge wave of um, different types of efforts that are happening. Um, but it, that, but I think if you can think about automation and think about um, doing it in a way that will allow for delivery, you'll get a lot of support. And again, there's um, a lot of different models out there and the clean slate movement is sort of consolidating those. So that's where I would encourage, um, you know, folks to, to turn if they're really thinking about thinking about how to impact and improve um, outcomes for those with criminal records. But more generally, in terms of general principles, kind of abstracting a bit, I think it comes down to thinking about de delivery of the second chance, how that actually will look and being as precise as possible in terms of getting, again, um, folks to the table. So for example, in the um, Pennsylvania example I talked about, the state police, the repository um, folks, uh, all the court people were at the table when the legislation was drafted. Um, so were you know, uh, folks who had been working with uh, people who had criminal records. Um, and thinking about removing barriers that are important to, to, to carrying out the, the law are important. So for example, as you mentioned before, fees can be a huge problem for folks. Um, and even if it seems trivial, that th those can be real obstacles. Um, trying to take, you know, I hate to say this as a law professor and being on a uh, law podcast, but trying to take um, the legal uh, discretion in the legal um, petitions process out of the um, out of the delivery, I think, is really key. So, you know, why isn't it the case that felons, after they've served their time and then have done whatever the law says, why don't they automatically get their right to vote back? Why do they have to go through a petition space process? That is a huge barrier to delivery of that second chance. So again, thinking about the design up front, thinking about the delivery mechanism and using automation as much as you can. If those commitments are made, I think um, you know the law is going to look different. It will not include petitions or discretionary processes or a lot of information that's outside the record. Um, so for such as a person's age or, you know, if they have a good moral character, it'll reflect things that you can measure based on looking the rec at the record itself. Um, and so I think that those types of um, design choices in the way we put the law together and the way we carry it out are, and the way we, we, we create the, line, uh, the, the law up front um, is, are very important. 
Mm -hmm. Well, so Colleen, in, in closing, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on our criminal justice system and kind of policy choices we make within that system in relation to the work you did on this project. Because I couldn't help but think that in a lot of ways, the the things you're describing here are like collateral consequences of a kind of broader kind of way of thinking about criminal justice policy that pervades the entire system. Yeah, I mean, I do think we're at a turning point and we've been there for a little while now in terms of thinking about is this the justice system that America wants to have in terms of thinking about um, you know, the mass criminalization and incarceration of individuals and particularly uh, men of color, right? And especially black and Hispanic men who are burdened by, um, by the criminal justice system in terms of how it's implemented and how, how much it keeps them outside of their communities where they need to be. Uh, I think that there is this realization that our system is not serving our interests, that we are, you know, an outlier by far and you know, when we compare ourselves to the rest of the world and we want to make that turn. But at the same time, we have um, instincts around public safety and, I, you know, I see it as myself in myself that I have this conflict where I want to give my kids second chances. I want to believe the best is, is possible. But I also, you know, feel like they need to have consequences for what they do. It's probably getting way too much into parenting more than you know anybody is really interested in. But I, I do see the conflict where there's a desire to, you know, ensure that um, they're going to do the right thing, but then also give them a second chance. And so I see in society we're conflicted as well. Um, you know, more, most recently in in California, we had uh, you know the, the recall of a judge who expressed clemency towards um, uh, you know towards um, towards a Stanford uh, athlete who had uh, committed rape. And obviously this is an extremely contentious case. I'm not gonna sort of go into the details of it, but the fact that it's shown sort of um, clemency, but done it in a way that a lot of people found problematic, I think discourages is uh, individual judges for making these sort of decisions to show, uh, you know, we wanna provide second chances. And so there's, there's this kind of desire to um, persecute. And I think that comes partly from the press and, you know, kind of uh, talking a little bit about, um, about misdeeds that are committed there's this kind of instinct that we want to punish and we don't believe people can get better. But in our own daily lives, we know that that's not the case. And so I think there's, there are these two different, there's this, this tension that comes from these two different instincts. But overall, I think the tide is turning towards, let's sort of try to roll back um, all the different forces that have contributed to mass criminalization, mass incarceration. And um, so I see this second chance work as, well, if we have those intents, let's make good on them and let's make sure we can deliver what, uh, what we're trying to, the, the change we're trying to, to affect. Great. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show, Colleen. I thought this paper was great. And I really think this is an incredibly important project. And I hope that some of the recommendations that you made in the paper will impact kind of policy decisions across the states and give more people second chances. Thanks so much for having me.